This was my first attempt at seeing sound waves. It worked well, sort of. I could see heat, maybe a clap, but it wasn't fast enough. And this is the new version. It captures sound waves moving at 340 meters per second. The response to that first video has been amazing and honestly I wasn't expecting many views other than the ones I got from forcing my kids to watch. But the comments all asked for details on the build and to be honest the first version was kind of a jumble of random kits that I just taped together. So I decided to amp it up a bit. I swapped the mess and built a new simplified design. And this time I'm using AI to speed up the development process. But here's the problem. A professional slurring system, the kind that MIT or Harvard uses, costs about $20,000 and lives in a vibration proof university lab. I definitely don't have 20 grand to spend on a slurring rig. So today I'm going to try and replicate that precision for under 200 bucks. Using parts from Amazon, a Raspberry Pi and a mirror. But before we build, we need to understand exactly what we're trying to catch. Air is invisible, right? Well, not exactly. It kind of acts like a fluid. You know the way a spoon looks bent when you pour it into a glass of water? That's called refraction. And light changes speed and direction when it moves through different densities. Hot air is less dense than cold air. And sound is just a moving wave of high and low density. If we track the light, we can see the sound. But the bending is microscopic. To amplify it, we need a mirror. And not just a flat bathroom mirror, but a curved one. Now here's how it works. Light travels from the slit and it covers the mirror area and reflects back to a sharp focal point exactly 3.2 meters away. At the focal point I place a tin wire that blocks most of the light so it never reaches the camera. But if the air is still the image is uniform, kind of smoky grey colour. But if the sound wave bends the light even a tiny bit up or down it hits the camera and it looks bright. Now I chose this 8 inch Newton reflector mirror as a sweet spot between size and bankruptcy. Anything smaller limits your field of view, anything larger gets exponentially more expensive. But I did try to go cheaper first with one of those flexible plastic mirrors, but let me save you the hassle. Terrible idea, the optical quality was non-existent, but it does make a surprisingly good frisbee. We need real glass with a long focal length, and why is that? It's leverage. We need to magnify the tiny bend in light so the camera can see it. Sound waves are tiny, we need to magnify them. But aiming a mirror with a path length this long is a bit of a nightmare. It's like trying to change the channel on your TV using a 3 meter long broomstick. The slightest tremor in your hand sends the tip flying wildly off target. If I just put this on a table, my footsteps alone would ruin the image. This needs to be rock steady. So the solution is to bolt it to a bunch of rocks. In this case, the masonry blocks in my shed wall. I mounted the mirror directly to the wall and I put the camera sensor on a shelf attached to a side wall. Now the floor can move and the optics stay dead still. The only downside? The light path is about 3.2 meters long and my workshop is 3.8 meters long. So it's very tight to get around the back. My advice is to compare the room size versus twice your focal length. Now there is one optical annoyance with this single mirror setup and that's double vision. The light passes through the sound wave twice once on the way to the mirror and once on the way back. To fix this I'd need a dual mirror Z type setup, but that doubles the cost. So for this budget we're going to live with the double vision. To hold the mirror onto the wall I designed this cell in FreeCAD. It creates a sort of kinematic mount. The mirror floats on three springs. And these thumb screws are my steering wheel. And the tread pitch determines my resolution. A quarter turn here moves the light a millimetre or so on the other side of the shed. For the light source I'm using two razor blades on a 3D mounted rail system. The gap needs to be adjustable which means they're spring loaded the blades. So loading this is a bit scary. You're basically wrestling a spring with a scalpel on the end. One slip and I'll be super gluing my finger back together. For the light block which is also spring mounted I tried wire but it was too curly. So I switched to this 0.5 millimeter stainless steel rod. And the goal is to position this rod so it blocks out most of the light returning. For the camera holder I had to design a sort of cantilever bracket so it stays level with the centre of the light beam. In Schlur and imaging a 2mm lens drop is a mile. One optical tip though is to get the mirror to actually fill the frame I had to manually adjust the back focus ring. This pushes the focal plane back maximising the sensor area so we don't get a tiny circle in the middle of the screen. Now alignment is where you lose your mind. 
the center of the mirror needs to be level with the center of the camera sensor, which is 3.2 meters away. This makes things a lot easier. But I use a little trick here. I moved my mobile phone back and forth until the reflection from the LED was nice and sharp. And this is my focal point. And I locked down the center of the rig here. Mechanically we're done, but a mirror is useless without a light source and a standard flashlight's not gonna work. I'm filming ultrasound at 40,000 Hertz. If I use a normal light, it's just gonna be a blur. I need to freeze time. And sound travels at 340 meters in a second. This creates a massive problem called motion blur. We need to freeze motion, and not with a mechanical shutter, but with a light. So I need a flash duration of roughly 10 microseconds. To get an LED bright enough in a tiny window, we have to push it beyond its rate of current. To do this, I use a cheap, adjustable boost converter to increase the LED voltage up to about 18 volts. This is safe for about a microsecond, but if the piping code crashes and leaves the pin high, then our LED instantly becomes a smoke machine. The Raspberry Pi are too weak to open the MOSFET fast enough, so I had to add this gate driver I see. This dumps a high current into the gate of the MOSFET and slamming it open in nanoseconds, and this gives us a nice clean square wave pulse. Lighting is half the battle, we also need to drive the sound, and standard audio amplifiers have filter designed to kill anything above 20 kHz, because humans can't hear them. But my ultrasound is 40,000 kHz, so I desoldered all the filter capacitors, and now we can go up to ultrasonic frequencies. Now I'm generating this signal using PWM at a few hundred kilohertz. To convert this to audio to drive my amplifier, I had to make this small filter circuit. This converts the PWM into a nice clean sine wave, which is then used to pulse the ultrasonic transducer. The sound can be timed to exactly match the timing of the LED pulses, so now we can look at any moment in time with the camera. Because the wave is identical, I can use the strobe effect just like a timing light on an engine, if I fire the flash at the exact same point in the wave cycle, I freeze the wave in place. Now, hardware is hard, but software is annoying. I tried to use a new Raspberry Pi 5, but it was a bit of a disaster. The Pi 5 uses a new architecture called ORP1, which breaks the Pi 4 direct memory access that we need for this project. Now, without DMA, the operating system continuously interrupts all our nice clean waveforms, and the image shakes. So, my advice is to stick with the Pi 4. I asked Gemini to write a script to bypass the OS, and it even created this nice user interface, so now I can control everything remotely, and not sit in the shed with loads of speakers at full blast. But one final warning, the Pi's GPIO pins are 3.3 volts, but the camera trigger expects 1.8 volts. So I use a simple voltage divider, which is a 1K and a 2K resistor, to drop the voltage level. Don't skip this or you're going to fry your camera sync pin. And finally be gentle because I ripped the pads off my camera board and had to perform microsurgery to fix it. So my advice is to use a strain relief. So everything is aligned and the code is running. And the room is dark. Let's see what the invisible sound waves look like. Now let's turn on the ultrasound and this is 40 kilohertz. You can see the sound waves emerging from the speaker and the air is literally being compressed and expanded in fixed layers. But watch what happens when I fire two emitters at each other. And this is an interference pattern where the waves meet. They either cancel each other or amplify each other. We're watching constructive and destructive interference live. Honestly, it's been fascinating to see how sound interacts with the world, and it's amazing what you can do with a bit of off-the-shelf equipment and a bit of imagination. But that's the thing about physics, it doesn't really care about budgets. It does what you tell it to do, well, most of the time anyway. We've built the hardware, but we're only using some of its potential. In the next video, I want to see if I can make this 3D. If you'd like to see that, hit subscribe. And all the CAD files and Python scripts are linked in the descriptions down below. This should give you everything you need to replicate my setup. So, go and have some fun.